The guideline was published um, in November 2019, um, but it took a long time to get to that point. I was invited to chair the guideline as an independent person, so I don't have personal experience of thyroid disease, so I don't, didn't have an opinion on what should or shouldn't be the, the kind of final answer to it. Um, but, and then we pulled together a, a committee of people who did have lots of experience. And my role was to make sure that everybody's voice was heard during that um, and make sure that the end product was actually fit for purpose. Um, and NICE kept a, a very close eye on that. So I'm going to talk about the guideline develop pro development process, how we scoped the topic, so how we decided what we were going to cover, um, how we engaged with the stakeholders, um, which was a lot of people in the room, I think, today, how we recruited the committee, um, and then um, how we also how we worked with NICE, um, and then the final output, and that will then lead on to the clinicians who'll tell you about the different parts of that. So the committee that developed the guideline, um, and I think it's really important to stress that there were a, a range of people on that committee, but the, the lay people are really important in developing the guideline because they had a range of experience, their own personal experience, but also contact with other, lots of other people with lots of different experiences. Um, and often those haven't worked out well, you know, and I think... Um, that was very clear throughout the process that there isn't a simple answer and thyroid disease is sometimes difficult to treat. Um, and I think the lay people kept bringing us back to that um, and that, that was a really important voice to have throughout the process. The technical team um, is the team of people from the National Guidelines Centre. So they, ha they have expertise in how to develop a guideline, how to review evidence. Um, how, they also know how NICE needs it laying out, so that the kind of technical parts of that. And then NICE oversee that, so they make sure that it's going to be fit for purpose, that it's going to be meet the needs of patients and meet the, meet the needs of clinicians and, and other stakeholders. We looked at the best available evidence, so they have very clear um, parameters for deciding what evidence you can use and what evidence isn't um, usable. And so, although there are thousands of articles out there, and some of the reviews that we did were absolutely enormous, not all of them are uh, usable because they haven't used the right control groups or they haven't compared like with like. Um, and so that's how you come to the best available evidence. So you don't look at every single paper that's ever been written, but everybody within the room, all the clinicians have probably read all those other papers and the lay members will have read other papers. And so you bring all that information as individuals and as, as clinicians with the technical team um, to the guideline. We looked at the health economics. So you look at the, again, there are some health economic papers and they can also do these amazing models, which are very technical, um, but involve looking at um, the, how good a treatment is, so how effective it is, and then look at how much it costs, um, and then look at what's the most effective treatment for the least cost, if it's possible. So often you'll get a treatment that's very cheap, but it's really not very good, whereas there's a treatment that's a bit more expensive, but actually it's much more effective. So you would choose the more expensive treatment because you're going to get a better outcome from it. So it's not always about the cheapest, it's about what's the most effective. And I think there's often this idea that it's all about saving money and it's all about making, getting the cheapest um, available treatment. But actually you're not doing that, you're balancing what's the most effective against you know, best value for money. So we had, in numbers, we had 13 committee meetings, um, 13 committee members and six co-optees. So the co main committee members came to every single meeting um, and were part of the key group, the decision-making group. The co-optees came in and advised us on specific things um, that, we, that we needed at, at different parts of the, of the um, process. And out of that, we got one guideline there were 16 evidence reviews, so that was 16 questions where we asked a question about 
what, what is the answer to this particular issue around treatment um, and came up with different sections within the guideline and 175 stakeholders are registered um, to respond and we had a fantastic response Firstly, to the scoping meeting right at the beginning, where we decided what questions we were going to ask. But also at the end, where we, we'd finished a draft guideline. Um, and then we got well over a thousand responses back, which was really helpful because it helped us to kind of shape, spot things that we'd not worded quite right, things that weren't clear, go back to the evidence again and just check what, what we'd done and then redraft um, to produce the final guideline. So thank you to everyone in the room who, who took the time to respond in that stakeholder consultation because that's a really important part of the development. Scoping right, for, right at the beginning um, is, is done by the... Uh, well, the topic comes from the Department of Health, so they identified that there wasn't a guideline um, about thyroid disease and that that was a gap in... in um, healthcare because there was a huge variation across the country in what was available, what treatments were being offered. Um, and so they asked NICE to develop a guideline. So NICE looked at it, agreed that there was a gap in the evidence or a gap in gui guidance available um, and they scoped out the key questions and part of that was discussing with clinicians and part of it was with um, lay members and there was a, a scoping consultation right at the beginning so people could email in about the scoping and there was also a scoping meeting and not all guidelines have a scoping meeting but they thought that thyroid was so important they really wanted to hear from the stakeholders and um, so they actually put on a, a scoping meeting and again there was a great response to that and lots of ideas and questions that came up out of that. So that all happened in September 2017 um, and the scope was um, reviewed and finalised. We then started recruiting. So recruitment happens with an open advert. So there's the NICE website um, advertises and lots of people applied and we picked the best, we think. Um, so we had me as the independent chair and then we had... Um, Christine, who's going to be speaking later, who was the um, clinical expert endocrino endocrinologist. Um, and then we had all these other people. So we had other endocrinologists, paediatric endocrinologists, because we were also looking at children and young people. Um, we had three lay members over the course of the guideline, two GPs, because it's really important to hear about primary care, because that's where people first present. Um, we had a specialist nurse, a uh, hospital pharmacist to talk about the medication available. And then our co-optees were a radiologist um, who looked at the um, scans and um, tests, uh, sort of radiological tests that were available. Um, a pathologist, thyroid surgeon, a biochemist, a psychiatrist and a medical physicist. So that was a... That was all the people that we thought were the key people who would be contributing to the care of people with thyroid disease. The NICE technical team, uh, just an amazing team. So they work on about six guidelines at a time um, and over two to three years. Um, there's a, a guideline lead and then various project managers, health economists and so on. And they will all go off and do the research, look at all the evidence that's available and then bring it back to the committee um, and in a digestible format. And then we sit around the table and try and piece it all together to make something that answers all the questions, that's coherent, that makes sense and that uses the best available evidence. And then balances that with the cost effectiveness. So, as I was mentioned earlier on, it's probably a bit small at the back, but the the graph on the right is looking at um, how effective and cost effective a treatment is and how using the evidence you choose which um, is going to be the, the best available, the best treatment option um, if, if possible. And sometimes there's more than one and I think that's what's happened in this guideline that there, 
there are various treatment options and they will depend on the individual preference, the, the health, um, the other side effects and, and the age of the person con concerned. So there isn't just a one size fits all, you have to do this. And I think that's a very clear part of the NICE guidance is, is that it's not mandatory. It's, it's guidance and it doesn't supersede um, clinical judgment and it doesn't supersede the patient's wishes. So it's about that, that kind of conversation going on. So we developed the draft guidance. Um, we published it and we got these, this fantastic stakeholder response. And each of the responses um, from the um, stakeholder organisations received an individual um, response from the committee um, as, as we looked at them. So we, we did actually read every single response. And it was, uh, they printed them off for me and it was quite a big wadge, so it was, it was really useful. Um, and then we adjusted it, responded, and then we published the final version on the 20th of November. People often say, how do I access the NICE guidelines? So I thought it might be quite useful just to show you when you go to the NICE website what you're looking at. Um, so if you Google nice.org.uk and put thyroid into the box, you get a selection of, of options. And this is, this is the guideline. So it's, it's called NG145, so that's National Guideline 145. Um, and it tell, so it tells you what, what the guideline is. And then on the left-hand side, you can see it's got the recommendations, recommendations for research, rationale and impact, so that's the reasons that each of the um, recommendations were made, and the context and discussion. <coughs> so this is the, the kind of main um, page that you start from when you go onto the NICE website. <coughs> you can then look at the tools and resources so this shows you there is summary versions, um, there, there's information about how it can go into practice, there's information about the um, health economics, that's the resource impact, um, and different suggestions on, on audit and service improvement. And then the actual um, guideline is then summarised as well into an information for the public section. It's very brief and superficial, so I suspect most people in this room will have read the full guideline because that's got all the detail in. Um, but if you just want a very brief overview, there is a, the information for the public section. And that focuses on the care that you should expect and about making decisions together. Um, and, you know, my background is, is um, I, I run another support group for a, a maternity-related um, condition. Um, and I've got a particular interest in helping people to use NICE guidelines to make decisions about their care. And I think making decisions together is a key part of using NICE guidance because it is designed for service users and for clinicians um, to, to use together. So hopefully the information is there. Um, and then the next page is about assessment and management. So all the evidence is there, um, looking at how, what we looked at, how we looked at it. And this gives you the overall summary. So it's very small, but it was just to give you an idea of the amount of stuff that there is on the website. It, the idea is that it's very transparent, that anybody can access it. You can see what's, what's up there. So that's how we developed it, what the end product was, and then looking to the future, because it doesn't stop there. Um, there's, the launch happened and unfortunately it coincided with the pre-election period so um, it was there wasn't a, a massive launch but you know it was launched on time um, the committee developed some research recommendations which have been prioritized but there's always an issue around funding there um, and so that can be a, a challenge finding competing with lots of other conditions for for a small pot of funding um, but uh, from Talking to some of the people in the room this morning, I think research seems to be one of the key things that um, particularly groups, uh, um, patient service user groups will be interested in going forward. And then there's always going to be new evidence, you know, as research comes in or research that's ongoing is published. 
Um, and that will be picked up by routine NICE surveillance. So they're constantly looking for new evidence, new information. If you find new information, you can email NICE, you email surveillance at nice.org.uk um, and they, they will have a look at, at what you send in and they'll look at it in relation to what's available, what, what's already in the guideline um, and what's new. Um, and it w the guideline will be routinely reviewed um, every few years to make sure that it's still as up to date as possible. Um, so that's how you develop a nice guideline and hopefully we're going to go through each individual bit now and um, look at what came out of it and then we'll have the panel discussion for an opportunity to answer questions. Thank you.